I would say to you that most communications don't work. When it comes to comms, these are the rational reasons we people should donate. Let's post it on Facebook. Let's do this. Let's make sure we get clicks. Let's get people to like this. It becomes the very mechanical without meaning to, and we lose the whole thing about how do we want people to feel, bearing in mind what we want them to do. How many of you in your organizations ask this question? How do we play a meaningful part in the lives of our customers, donors, supporters, advocates, volunteers? That's the million dollar question. Hey there, folks. Welcome back to the Fundraising Bright Spots podcast. This is episode 149. My name's Rob Woods, and this is the podcast for fundraisers who want ideas and maybe a little dose of inspiration to help you raise more money and really enjoy your job. Now, I have to tell you, I've been really looking forward to this one because I get to share with you ideas from someone who's made a big difference to my own approach to marketing, communication and fundraising in the last few years. Grant LeBoff is a marketing and communications expert and is the best-selling author of many excellent books, including Sticky Marketing and Digital Selling, which debuted at number one on the Amazon charts. With many years' experience helping both commercial and not-for-profit organizations, Grant is excellent at explaining valuable insights in a down-to-earth, meaningful way. If you're a regular listener, you'll probably have heard my previous interview with Grant, which was episode 142, in which he gives a helpful, powerful frame on how changes in technology in the last 25 years have affected the choices we make when we communicate or raise funds for our charity. Given all the enthusiastic feedback we got about that episode, I was keen to talk to Grant again, and in particular, to ask him what we can do in the context of the many things that make fundraising difficult now. Whether it's the cost of living crisis, the ever faster pace of change, this sense of political chaos and uncertainty, or the ever shorter attention spans of the people who care about our causes, I wanted to know what we can do to cut through and be effective in spite of the difficult backdrop. So let's get into it. Here's my recent interview with the brilliant Grant LeBoff. Hello, Grant. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Rob. Nice to be with you. How are you today? Yeah, I'm good. Good. So thanks so much for making time. I know you're a very busy person. I've enjoyed reading your books over the years. You very kindly, a few years ago, came and did a, an excellent session for our group of fundraisers to do with the implications of certain changes and trends in technology and in, in marketing generally. Before we get into this particular topic for the interview today, to put it in context, I know you're an author. I know you also have a sticky marketing club where people can learn about marketing. How do you describe your role? Yeah, so I consider myself these days as a sort of marketing evangelist. I ran an agency years ago. I've written several books. So I tend to write a few more at some point. But I go around the world speaking around marketing. I, I do consultancy with businesses. I find people are so frustrated with putting effort, time, and often money as well into marketing and not getting the results that they want. And I think there are so many myths and nonsense spoken about marketing. And that's a problem because people follow some of these things unknowingly and, and, and end up being disappointed with the results they get. So I've always seen my job in more recent times is to kind of go around the world and evangelize about what works, why it works, and just hopefully supporting people in achieving the results and the effectiveness that they desire. Mm. Thank you. And um, just hearing you talk then remind me of how much your earlier book, Sticky Marketing, and then more recently, Myths of Marketing, both of those helped me a lot. In terms of today, I guess the context just is really tough for lots of charities and lots of the fundraisers within those charities who's work so hard to connect with people who care and find ways for those people to donate and reasons for them to donate. They work so hard. Goodness knows, 23 years ago when I started out as a fundraiser, it was hard. But I really think the context now, it just it both is harder and it feels harder. And some of the reasons I think that people are Finding it harder, it's you know, both the cost of living crisis right now and many of our audiences do have less money available to give to the causes they care about. But then also these bigger picture things in terms of a sense of chaos, 
a sense of not only change speeding up, but also in a more chaotic, complex, less predictable way than it would have 20 or 30 years ago. And I guess also the fact that we ourselves can be distracted by the bad news out there, more distracted than I would have been 23 years ago because I wouldn't have had a smartphone on my desk then. And also the fact that our audiences we're trying to reach out to, probably their attention span is shorter now than it would have been. Maybe there are some upsides to all of these. Maybe you could help us see those upsides as well. But um, at a time when many of the people I teach are facing struggles, but still the targets are there, and goodness knows the need to help various important causes is greater than ever because of various turmoil going on. I wonder if we could just have a chat about, from your point of view, going around the world, looking at both commercial and some not-for-profit organisations, how you see these themes and what you think are some things we could do to handle them and overcome them. Yeah, so I think it's a great point you're making. I think we are more time poor than we've ever been. Um, I think technology, while it liberates us in some ways, it stresses us out in other ways because it's the immediacy of everything today. You know, in the old days, someone would write you a letter and then you'd get it. You might not get it straight away and you'd have some time to respond and you'd write back. Today, a WhatsApp comes in and, you know, someone's noticed the blue ticks that you've read it and you feel compelled to respond almost immediately without any thought. And we live in this very difficult world. And then, of course, economically, uh, things are fairly tough. The cost of living crisis and other things at the moment, which obviously if you're a not for profit trying to, you know, elicit support and donations for your cause isn't easy. And I think there is a feeling in the world of uncertainty. Um, Changes is quicker, that's for sure, again, because of the speed in which communication happens. So I do think there is that feeling of chaos and feeling of uncertainty and and the pace of change is is quicker than it's ever been. So all of these things definitely do make it challenging for, for people. And I think the medicine that I'd give to people in some ways to to kind of fix all this almost sounds too simple, but I'm sure we'll embellish it as we go on. But that is to not lose sight of what you're doing. And what I mean by that is, I think in this age of technology, we actually have to make an effort to be human. And I know that sounds kind of, what do you mean, make an effort to be human? Uh, But I think we hide behind websites and social media and clicks and likes uh, and all of these different things. And I think fundamentally, human beings haven't changed. We've evolved, we've adapted, but we haven't changed. We are the same fundamentally. And therefore, I think at the very, very essence, this is about building relationships with people. And this is about moving them emotionally. And this is very, very important. So my background is behavioral psychology. It's what I studied. And we've learned more about the human brain in the last 50 years than we knew in the previous 5,000. And we know that human beings have two systems of thinking, which we call system one and system two. System one is the subconscious mind and system two is the conscious mind. System one, we normally refer to as the emotional mind. It's not correct, by the way. It's subconscious. It's not emotional, but it's a very nice way of thinking about it. So as long as everybody knows that's not strictly true, um, because I don't want to mislead people, it's, it's a very nice way of thinking about it. And system two is people often think about it as rational. It's not rational, it's conscious. And in case they're not the same thing, you can be completely irrational and conscious at the same time. But nevertheless, thinking about it in terms of emotional and rational are very, very helpful as long as you sort of bear in mind that really it's subconscious and conscious. So why am I telling you this? Why does it matter? If you're a not-for-profit organization, you're communicating. Why does it matter? Because behavioral psychologists argue as to how much of what we do is system one and how much of what we do is system two. But the, uh, the parameters of debate are so slim that for us practitioners in the comms world, it doesn't really matter. And the range is anything from 90 to 97% system one, depending on who you ask. So I, I think the majority of behavioral psychologists will tell you it's 90-10, system one to system two. Some people tell you it's 95-5. There are a few people that say 97-3. But the point is, is that system one is the domain of decision making. So much so that there's a quote from a guy called Jonathan Haidt, who's a leader in the field. And Jonathan Haidt says, the rational mind thinks of itself as the Oval Office, where really it's the press office. 
In other words, you know, we think that the rational mind makes all the decisions, but really the domain of decision making is system one, and then we post rationalize in system two. Why am I telling you this? Why does it matter? Because this, this will scare people, perhaps, but hopefully it scares them and then they can do something about it. So I would say to you that most communications don't work. And the reason why I'm saying that to you is everybody listening to this right now, think about your website. Have you architected your website for system two or system one? Most people have architected their website for system two. This is who we are. This is what we do as an organization. This is who we're trying to help. This is why it matters. Please donate. Please support us. Please get involved. It's all system two. And that's how most people communicate when they have to. But it's not the way to communicate. The way to communicate is system one. So here's the question you ask. What do I want my website viewers to do? Let's say you want them to donate. Okay. If they're going to donate, how do they need to feel? That's the million dollar question. And then you fashion all your comms around eliciting that feeling. Images, colors, the stories that you tell. And by the way, all comms work like that. I'll give you an example. You're sitting down with a difficult member of staff to have a difficult conversation. What do I want them to do at the end of this meeting? What's the behavioral change I'm looking for? So therefore, how do they need to feel? So now how do I conduct the meeting? Do I go for a walk with them? Do I take them for a coffee? Do we go out to eat? Do I do it in their office? Do they do it in my office? Do we go off site? All of those things will change the emotional state. And therefore, I say all good comms is theatre because all good comms is staged. And I don't think people think about it like that. They go, oh, you've got to donate to my cause because of this. And then they tell people, but it's all system two. This is what's going on in the world. This is why this cause matters. And this is why you need to help. Now, I just want to be very clear because I don't want to mislead anyone. You do need system two, but system two won't convince someone to donate. It won't. That's system one. System two is the alibi. System two is what they're going to tell everybody else. And if you don't give them system two, they won't do it. So I'll give an example, right? I get a direct mail through my door and I'm moved by the, the communication and I decide to give a hundred pounds. So I go home and I say to my wife, oh, by the way, don't panic. When you see a hundred pounds on our credit card, it's because I donated it to this organization. And my wife says, okay, why did you donate to them? This is what I'm not going to say. Just felt right, man. Right? I'm not going to say that because it almost seems silly to say that. So I'm going to say to my wife, well, they do this and they do that. And I thought it was real worthwhile and we should support it. So I'm going to use system two as my alibi as to why I, I donated. Now, even if I move to give, if there's no alibi, I probably won't give. Even if, by the way, the only person I have to justify the spend to is me, because we still have to justify our decisions to ourselves on a rational level, even though we make them on an emotional level. So please don't dump system two. I don't want any, anybody listening to this to do that, because that, that would be you know, a very bad thing to do. You need system two, but please understand that your donation will happen through system one. And therefore, you have to make sure you're not losing your humanity. And I, I don't mean that in the literal sense, Forgive me for suggesting anybody lose their humanity. But I think when it comes to comms, these are the rational reasons we people should donate. Let's post it on Facebook. Let's do this. Let's make sure we get clicks. Let's get people to like this. It becomes the very mechanical without meaning to. And we lose the whole thing about how do we want people to feel, bearing in mind what we want them to do. And, and, and when you think about it in those terms, Life becomes a bit simpler. Forget the chaos. Forget the cost of living. If you can move someone, they'll still want to. They'll still be moved to give. They might give a bit less than they did before, okay, but they'll be moved to give. And I think we get so bombarded with all of this other stuff that we lose sight of the central tenet of comms, which is to move another individual. Hi, it's Rob, and I wanted to let you know about our two long-standing training programs designed to help you grow high-value fundraising results. That's Major Gifts Mastery and Corporate Partnerships Mastery, which both start again in April 2024. These programs help you make progress through a combination of masterclasses and individual coaching support. To give you a sense of how they help you improve not only your skills, but also your confidence and your results, 
Here's some feedback we had from Grace Cannings, who took part in Medjugift's mastery. I think going back to being kind of more confident, I'd say that it's helped me become more calm in meetings with donors. And I know, I think it was maybe a couple of weeks after our first session, I was in a meeting with a donor and managed to secure a 25k gift from them which was incredible and it was the first meeting I'd actually run by myself without anybody else from my team being there so it felt like a really big win for me and then also alongside that we've had more people renewing their donations and gifts as I think just generally the level of communication that I've been able to give with people has been great yeah I just implore anybody to go on this course it's been fantastic. If you'd like to find out more about either of these two programs, go to brightspotfundraising.co.uk forward slash services. This might be a little different, but I remember how much I was helped when someone once told me that people don't buy really in true neuroscience terms. They don't actually buy a product or a service. They're actually buying a feeling or an identity. And those two words help me get much more clear or what feeling am I buying if I buy that product? And or what is the identity I might aspire to having if I choose to support this cause at that level? And as a shortcut, just to answer those two questions, or what is the feeling for giving to this cause? And or being willing to have coffee with someone from this charity, what is the feeling reason as to why they would do it? And or something about who they are or who they think they are or who they want to be. And just, you won't immediately know the answers to those, but fairly quickly, I think most charities can get answers to those two questions and work back from that. And at its, that's a pretty shortcut way. It's probably more to the argument you're making than that. But if we just start there, we can do a pretty quick check as to whether that feeling and or a signal about that identity is on the website or is on your invitation or film inviting someone to your event or if it's not? Yeah, 100%. And I, I, I agree with you. I'd actually even make it simpler than that. So I would say we don't value things. We value what they mean. So the question always is, what's the meaning? What does it mean if I donate to this organisation? And that is about emotion, right? So so we, we you know, it's always interesting, isn't it? I've got a pair of candlesticks that were my grandmother's and I remember her lighting them and we use them sometimes and they're not worth very much money. I mean, in monetary terms, if someone, you know, I got robbed and someone stole them, monetary term wouldn't be worth their while, but, but in monetary terms, they're not worth anything, but they mean everything. But the, the value isn't in the candlesticks. The value is I remember my grandmother lighting them. I remember my grandma using them and, and it evokes those, those feelings and the, that meaning, right? So we don't value things. We value their meaning. You know, someone that needs to have the latest iPhone. They don't value the iPhone, but it's what it says about them, doesn't it? You know, I'm a leader. I'm in tech. I'm up to date. I'm all of those things. You know, that, that's how people perceive it. So understanding what the meaning is is and that's also very important because you know when someone donates what people often do not for profits is they focus very much on what it means for the people you are helping they don't really think about what it means for the person who's giving and if you can articulate what it should mean for them and what it evokes for them and what it says about them you're much more likely that people will be uh, proactive um, and want to get involved because you've given it meaning for not that it should doesn't have meaning for the people you're helping as well it does but that, that there's a relationship between those two things you know that the people you are helping and the giver and actually if you can make that link in terms of meaning and in terms of emotion that means something uh very much else and the, and the one other thing i would say and and how it's articulated i can make it very simple the other thing that i think people have to be very mindful of especially in difficult circumstances is empathy sometimes to create empathy with your community with the audience that you're trying to speak with makes a big difference so it's very interesting i see very few communications talk about the cost of living crisis unless they're trying to talk about the cost of living crisis specifically. But actually, it's quite interesting to say to a donor, 
I know there's a cost of living crisis and I know things are tough. But if you were going to make a difference just once this month, this might be the way to do it. And actually what you create is a sense of empathy. Because as soon as I get, oh, that organisation gets me, they know that things are hard for me at the moment, you're more inclined to give. Because, you know, people just want to feel understood. And, and understood by the organisations that are asking you to help, understood that by the organisation I used to support. You know, if I, understand, if I think you get me, I'm more inclined to want to be part of you. So I put it in a very unsophisticated way, just so I got my point across. It can be dressed up in other ways, but the principle is very important. But this is all about feeling. Yeah, that's so interesting when you say that, Grant, because I do know of some organisations that have been very proactive and upfront during the cost of living crisis in communicating with people who already support letting them know that we understand it must be really hard for you right now. And for instance, if you need to take a break, take a holiday from donating to us, we totally understand. Please do just let us know where you're at. Uh, and, um, and some other organisations where they weren't even offering that break. They were just sort of early in the pandemic. They were basically reaching out, thanking people for everything they've done so far and acknowledging that times must be tough for you now and we hope you're doing okay and not even asking for donations and in both those situations various charities have let me know that being upfront and understanding of that situation and not proactively asking for money actually not only did it lead to the donors really appreciating it and therefore a greater level of trust but also even in the short term it led to an increase in donations rather than a downturn in donations i wonder if we could move on to any other things you think we as charities could do for instance in deepening relationships with our donors or we could call them customers um, in a time when tech seems to bring advantages but also might separate us from those donors who care yeah well i think yeah thank you i think your examples are brilliant because you know what you're what you're talking about those with those organizations that did that is there's a basic level of making the donors, the supporters feel understood. And that's a basic human need. A basic human need is to, is to feel understood. And here's what's really interesting. If you're listening to this right now and ask yourself two questions, how many people on the planet do I really think understand me? And I reckon most people are hard pushed to get past five. And it's no reflection on them. I just think that's just how we feel. Most people don't understand us. And then if you think about your closest relationships, could be a parent, could be a partner, could be a child, could be a sibling, could be a best friend, whatever, it doesn't matter. But your closest relationships are probably the people that you feel understand you the most in the world. They just get you. And, and if, you, if you just widen that out slightly to an organisational level, it's not the same, I understand. Do you demonstrate to your supporters, to your donors, um, to your advocates that you understand them, that you get them? Because the more they feel understood, the more they feel you get them, the more they feel part of your organisation, the more they feel a sense of belonging, the more they want to help, they want to donate, they want to be a part of it. Because this is an organisation that I can stand with. This is an organisation that understands me, you know, and that's very, very important. And therefore, I would say this is that I think a massive flaw and it's, it sounds so simple, but it isn't a massive flaw in most organisations communications is they don't know their customers well enough. They don't know their donors well enough. They don't know their supporters well enough. They don't know their customers well enough. So I'm going to show you how extreme I've got to in the commercial world. So when I work with a commercial organisation, so I'm fortunate enough to do consultancy for commercial organisations. I do sometimes not-for-profits as well, but commercial organisations all over the world, some very big, some a bit smaller. I now insist that the marketing department spends 20% of its time and just think about that. That means one day a week. I mean, it doesn't have to be that prescriptive, but just so you understand what I'm saying, 20% of its time hanging out with its customers. Because I'd say no business went bust because they knew their customers too well. No not-for-profit will do badly because they know their customers too well or they know their supporters or their donors too well. But plenty mess it up because they don't know them well enough. 
And, and I think it's so fundamental and so crucial and people just don't do it. They spend too much of their time guessing and there's no need to guess because you can hang out with your donors, your supporters, whether it's, you know, certain organizations you go to, certain groups you go to, certain events you go to, just one on one conversations, whatever. But it, it, it's so fundamentally important uh, and people don't do it enough. Here's the reason. Where's the value of comms in an organization? So obviously there's a value in comms in creating effective comms and getting donors and getting supporters. But I would say that when an organization is having a conversation around the boardroom table, metaphorically speaking, it could be around the coffee table or the pub table, it's okay. But wherever it is, when you're having that conversation, the person in comms should be able to be the voice of the customer. They should be able to say, this is what I think our customers are going to say about that. This is what I think our supporters are going to say about that. This is what I think our donors are going to say about that. And not because they're guessing, because they spend so much time with them, they've actually got a really good idea. That doesn't mean they shouldn't sanity check it afterwards, by the way, and verify that they're correct. But, but you understand what I'm saying. Do you have anybody in your organization, or are you that person that knows the customer, the donor, the supporter, the advocate so well that they that they can understand that because I would say to you if you don't have someone like that in your organization your comms is always going to fall short it just is and the other thing is is here's the million dollar question see comms isn't that difficult it's just human but I want to I'd be interested to know it's rhetorical obviously because no, the audience can't answer me but but it'd be a really interesting thing to ask right how many of you in your organizations ask this question how do we play a meaningful part in the lives of our customers? How do we play a meaningful part in the lives of our customers? Donors, supporters, advocates, volunteers, doesn't matter. Edit as appropriate, right? But that's the million dollar question. I want these people to donate to my organization to help these people over here, okay? How are you playing a meaningful part in their lives? What are you doing that makes their lives more meaningful? Because people will do things because it means something, because I get a sense of belonging, because I get a sense of well-being, because I feel like I'm doing something good, because I feel like it's worthwhile. And these are all emotions. They're never logical. Nobody ever says, well, I'm doing it because... 50 pence a day gives the supply of water to people over there. Nobody ever says that. They go, I think it's a good thing to do. I think it's a worthy thing to do. It makes me feel good about myself. I'm happy to be making a contribution back to the planet, back to that community, back to whatever. People always talk in terms of feelings. So if you can answer in your communications, how do we play a meaningful part in the role of our customers, donors, supporters, you'll find your communications become that much better. But don't guess that. Spend time with them so you understand it. So that makes sense, Grant, if we ask ourselves that question and hang out there, try and get answers, share those answers, and for that to inform, A, how I talk in my everyday communication ongoingly, but also where I can find more people like this. Because if I go to, to them, I'm likely to get clues for where more of them hang out. And the truth is, some of our job, a lot of our job isn't going to be person to person. How does, uh, what's the next point you would make for when I need to communicate in a way that it's to the many? Yeah, so you're, you're 100% right. So I've talked a lot about human to human, and I think that's where it starts. You know, so, you know, what's the behavioral change I want my audience to make? Donate to me. How do they need to feel? How do I elicit that emotion? What are the images I use? What are the things I do for that? In order to do that, am I spending enough time with my donors, supporters, volunteers? Do I understand them? And then how do I play that meaningful part in their lives? So there's a lot of human connection, human interaction there, which feeds into the organizational communications because, yes, a lot of things are going to be a post on social media or a poster or an advert or a direct mail or other things. So I think that's important. So I think where this then plays in and where these two collide, where they meet, is in a word that people get frightened of sometimes, because as soon as I say it, they think lots of expensive and lots of money. But the word is brand. And I think that people underestimate, especially smaller organisations. 
the power of brand and really what brand is. So let me just say a couple of things. I think brand is more important today than it's ever been before. And the reason why is we live in a world of scarcity of attention. We live in a world we are deluged by messages all the time, right? We don't have enough attention. Everything's bombarding us. And brand is the way that you cut through. People talk a lot of nonsense about brand because people often talk about brand as being a point of difference. Brand isn't about differentiating yourself. It can be, of course. But brand is about being distinctive. So, you know, are McDonald's and Burger King similar? Yeah. In fact, there's not much to tell them apart, really. But they're distinctive. You wouldn't walk into McDonald's by accident. Because it's very distinctive. Are Coke and Pepsi similar? Well, I'd say they're so similar that most of the time you go to a bar and they only stop one drink. Most people go, yeah, that one would do. You know, can I have a Coke, please? We've only got Pepsi. That's fine, right? But Coke is distinctive. Pepsi is distinctive. You wouldn't confuse the two. So what brand allows you to do is it allows you to become distinctive in your marketplace. Now, your marketplace could literally be your local community. It could be the 10 roads in which you operate. It could be if you're Oxfam or, you know, Save the Children, it could be global. doesn't matter whether you're a, a big, massive organisation or whether you're literally just serving three streets in your local community. But brand allows you to stand out. So it's very, very important that you invest in brand, that you think about brand. And by the way, you're ruthlessly consistent with brand. Because when you, what, this is what people do. They put out a brand message they use it for a little bit and then they get bored of it and they change it. Wrong, 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 wrong. Never, ever change your brand. Get it right and then use it forever. You know, it's interesting. I think Nike have been using Just Do It. Um, I, I want to say for, uh, I think, 45 years or something, maybe more. I'm not bored of it. I'm sure the marketers in Nike are bored of it. They'd love to change it. But I'm not bored of it as a customer because I don't think about it most of the time. But what happens is it becomes comfortably familiar. And that's the whole point of branding. You know, Kit Kat have been using have a break forever, but it still works. And I don't, I'm not, I eat too many Kit Kats. So I like chocolate, but it doesn't, it doesn't bore me because I don't think about it 24 seven. I'm sure if you work for Kit Kat, you're bored, but you should never change your brand unless it becomes culturally irrelevant. So just as an example of that, Coke have moved from making original Coke, their flagship product, to making Coke Zero, their flagship product, because in the health conscious times where obesity is more of a problem and diabetes is more of a problem because of our sedentary lifestyles and everything else, where original Coke full of sugar in 1975 was an OK product to be touting, in 2023, with all the health considerations, it's no longer an acceptable product. So if Coke didn't change their brand, they'd have probably gone bust over time. They'd have become culturally irrelevant. So they had to change their brand. But if your brand isn't culturally irrelevant, don't change it. Just keep it, keep it, be ruthlessly consistent. And the, the key behind that consistency is emotion. What does your brand stand for? By the way, there's no such thing as a logical brand. You know, why do people think Apple's better than any other leading media device manufacturer? Well, you could say, well, Apple does this and Apple does that. Ultimately, it's emotional. You know, I just like apples because X, Y and Z. Right. Uh, why? Why do people I've got a son who doesn't want to wear any other trainers than Nike trainers? Why? Really? Nike that much better than Adidas or any other leading brand? Not really. They're not. Right. But there's an emotional attachment to, to it. Right. So there's no such thing as a logical brand. All branding is emotional. A lo logical brands an oxymoron. All branding is emotional. So the key to having a powerful brand is understanding what do we stand for emotionally as an organization? So Nike stand for winning. Nike is all about being the best version of yourself that you can be. So when it's, I say winning, it's not about winners and losers. It's about being the best version of yourself that you can be. That's what they mean by winning. Disney's all about magic, imparting magical experiences. It doesn't matter if it's a film, a visit to their theme park, a go on the cruise or some time in a retail outlet. Right. It's all about creating a magic, a feeling of magic. So what's your organization about? 
Is it about a feeling of hope? Yeah. Is it a feeling? Is it a, about a feeling of beauty? Is it about a feeling of confidence? What are you trying to invoke as a feeling to your donors and to your supporters? And then you need to be ruthlessly consistent with delivering it. And what you can do one to one with, you know, human relationships. And when you're hanging out with customers and, and donors and, and things like that, brand allows you to deliver an emotion on a mass scale. That's what brand is. It's the delivery of an emotion to an audience. And that's why it's as important whether you're running a tiny little charity out the back of your house for a local school or whether you're running some huge organization across the globe. It doesn't make any difference. Brand is your vehicle for delivering a feeling to an audience. But you have to be ruthlessly consistent in that. So the most important thing is what do we stand for? What are we about? What's the feeling we evoke at a brand level? And then always be delivering that in terms of the colors, the images that you use, the language that you use, so the way that you phrase things. And if you get that right, and then you always think about your communications in terms of what do we want people to do? So what's the feeling we've got to evoke in this particular piece of comms on this website? This is a call to donate. So how do we need people to feel? Can we evoke that emotion? And then you spend enough time with your customers, donors, supporters, that you understand how to play a meaningful part in their lives and you do understand them. When you put those things together, you create the most eminently human organization. And then social media is a tool and AI is a tool. And all of those things are amazing, but they're tools. But you must never lose sight of the central thing that you're doing because you're in the most human of businesses. And I would say when you're in not-for-profit, and you're in the business of helping others, even more than a commercial organization, you're in the most human of businesses. And I think people lose sight of that. You know, they're coming to work every day or into the organization every day and they're, how do we raise donations? And let's do a telemarketing campaign and let's put this out and let's ask for donations here. And it becomes too technical. And all of those things matter, but never lose sight of the fact that at the heart of everything you're doing is this emotion, is this humanity. And if that's where you start, cost of living crisis, uncertainty, chaos in the world, shortage of attention spans, all of those things are true. But when you make humanity front and center, all of those things are surmountable because your starting point is so grounded in the right points and then you go out from there. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Grant. We've covered a lot of ground and you've brought it right back down to, to summarise those three or four things that we can actually make sure we're giving our attention to and follow through on. Doesn't mean it's easy to do all of those, but if we know week in, week out, we're trying to answer those questions and, and take the implications of those answers into our activities and tactics, it must help in reaching out to the people that care about this cause and helping them feel understood and giving them opportunities to donate and make the difference that they, they want to make. Thank you so much for explaining it so clearly and practically so that we know what we can do. If people would like to find out more, I know that you've got lots of other valuable resources. Uh, is it Sticky Marketing Club? Where could we go to find out more other resources and or find out about your books? Absolutely, Sticky Marketing Club, and the, the URL is stickymarketing.com. So if people just go to stickymarketing.com, there's loads of video and resource and other things, all free that people can access and uh, utilize. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Grant. I really do appreciate it. I look forward to catching up with you another time to learn some more. But for now, Grant LeBoff, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you. So there you go. I really hope you found Grant's perspective interesting. As usual, there's a short summary as well as a transcript of the episode and a link to Grant's website, Sticky Marketing Club, on the podcast section of our website at brightspotfundraising.co.uk. And if you're a corporate fundraiser or a major gifts fundraiser and you'd like to find out about our two flagship programs, that's Corporate Partnerships Mastery or the Major Gifts Mastery Program, which have now helped hundreds and hundreds of people to grow fundraising income over the last 10 years. We're now taking bookings for the next programs, which start in April 2024. And at the time I'm publishing this, the early discount saving worth £400 is still available. To find out more, 
go to brightspotfundraising.co.uk forward slash services. And if you've not yet subscribed to this podcast, please do click that button now so that you get immediate access to our full back catalogue, including, for example, my previous chat with Grant, where he shares a way of understanding changes in recent history that I have to say have had a profound effect on my approach to fundraising and communication in recent years. If you found Grant's ideas helpful today and you think this episode would help other people, please do share it on social media and with other people in your own charity. We'd love to hear what you think. On X or Twitter, Grant is at Grant Leboff, and I am at Woods underscore Rob, and we're both on LinkedIn. Thank you so much for listening and supporting our show. Good luck with your fundraising and communication, and I look forward to sharing another episode with you very soon. Mm-hmm.